Hey, it's editor Liz here, popping in with a quick note on this episode. When we recorded this episode, she and the Princesses of Power creator N.D. Stevenson was using a different name and different pronouns. We have edited the episode to reflect his current pronouns and name. This has resulted in us referring to the creator simply as Stevenson throughout the episode and caused a few awkward cuts, but respecting the creator's name and pronouns is way more important than episode flow. So thanks for your support and understanding. If we missed any pronouns or names, please let us know on our Discord, or you can shoot an email to hello at hotbaddies.club. Thanks, and I'll let you get into the Catra episode now. Hot Baddies Club is Amico. All right, part two is here. Okay, let's get right into it. Dog person or cat person, go. Dog person. Right? <laughs> oh wow of all the things i'm thinking forward to the twilight episode i have a lot of thoughts that i think might be my most controversial takes but i also don't want to piss off cat people so twilight episode is coming mm-hmm. okay i feel like you and i are always like really alike and then it's surprising when we're not alike yeah so i'm definitely a dog person but i like if you like cats that's like your thing that's okay they just like don't mm-hmm. They don't usually fire off in my brain the same things that I see them doing to my friends, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, my friends are like, a cat is literally alive and sitting there and breathing. See? See that? And, like, they're like, oh, I can't even imagine the joy they must be feeling at that moment. Yeah. But to me, I don't, I don't feel that same level of intrinsic joy when I look at a cat, the way I, when I look at a dog, almost always I get that little thing sparking, you know? Oh yeah. A dog will almost always make me smile. Like if I see someone walking with a dog, so I don't currently have a dog because we lived, we have been living in a small apartment in New York and we were like, we don't, we want to make sure the dog gets enough uh, exercise and everything, but we're going to be moving. And after we move, I've Yay. convinced my husband that we should get a dog. So we will get a dog, a small, small smallish dog. So I'm really excited about that. But yeah, cats, I don't have anything against them. I think part of the like magic of them is dampened for me because I'm allergic to them. Not like deathly allergic, but if I go and stay at somebody's house who has a cat after like, you know, a few hours, I start to get sniffly. If I stay over the night, it's like I'm sniffly and my eyes are itchy. And it's just like oh, if I no. touch the cat, then I always have to make sure to wash my hands because if the cat like licks me or scratches me or anything, I can get like, you know, like welts and oh, hives no. and stuff. So it's just like the only time I've ever broken out in hives in my entire life was after I touched something that had cat pee on it. So I'm, I'm pretty – not like – dangerously allergic but i'm like fairly allergic to cats wow yeah Yeah, i don't think i'm allergic i do like anime cat boys a lot there's a there's a deeper story there maybe we'll get around to one at some point (laughs) but like the anime cat girl very common trope in anime there's less cat boys but uh when they do show up they usually have that very adorable you know cat based characters they with that personality are very Mm -hmm. fun which is yeah which is how we ended up here i think yeah so we're both dog people sorry to all the cat people out there oh the other story i was going to tell is our friends all have cats or like with this one group of friends everyone has cats and our group chat where we're supposed to just be like talking to each other and hanging out and keeping in touch they all got cats and it just turned into (laughs) here's a picture of my cat. Look at my cat. It's, you know, just like you said, like it's alive. It's, <laughs> it exists <laughs> in my life. Like, oh, look, my cat is walking here, sitting at the window or whatever. And it's like, that's cute, I guess, but I don't get it. I don't understand. Are you still in the group chat? Yeah. Cause these are like our close friends, but it's so much of it devolves into cat pictures. It's, I think it's like calmed down a little bit, but at some point it was like, we were the literally the only people in the group chat that didn't have a cat. And so my husband and I would take pictures of each other, like being like, Oh look, my husband's on the couch. <gasps> that's everybody. So good. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Just Photoshop <laughs> some ears on him. It's fine. Yeah. 
<laughs> anyway. Um, oh, my God. Yeah. No offense right. to cat people. I just no, am not one. We love you, cat people. We love yeah. how much you care about your cats. We that need is, the balance. It's like so adorable. We need yes. the balance of cat and dog people together. Yeah. So, so I guess this podcast isn't balanced because... <laughs> <laughs> Look, look, this is our tribute episode to cat people. Mm-hmm. Okay. All and our we- guests have to be cat people. <laughs> <laughs> totally. All right. So this is a cat themed uh, episode about Catcher the character. If you're stumbling in here and you don't know what the heck's going on, uh, this I'm is- sorry. <laughs> We're sorry already. Um, this is the Hot Baddies Club, where we talk about hot fictional characters that have like a bad edge to them that we have crushes on. And my name is Miko. And I'm Liz. And uh, I already said the name, so we screwed it up. I love those hot baddies. Hot Baddies Club is me. So this is the episode about Katra from She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. We're going to read the qualifications for Katra from our Hot Baddies database. And after that, we will be crossing the spoiler line. So if you have not seen She-Ra and maybe you haven't listened to our last episode, please go back and listen to that episode, catch up on the show, and then you can return to this episode. I see you take you when you're it. Okay, so we use the Hot Baddies database to determine the qualifications for why a character belongs on the podcast. And we tag them with the various attributes that mean that they qualify. So without further ado, Liz, read to us what makes Katra a hot baddie. Katra is a love interest, female, villain, a bully. A teenager, anthropomorphic, has a tail, popular, is an abuse survivor, is a fighter, and is in the military or military adjacent type of situation. I don't think any of those need to be explained, right? No, I think actually it's interesting because like, she, I would say she's one of the least po- problematic bullies, but I still feel like she kind of is a bully. <laughs> So she somehow gets away with being bad, but being like not too bad, which I think fits the theme of She-Ra pretty well. Yeah. I think it's also that everyone but her, literally every other character but her knows that she doesn't really want to be doing what she's doing and that she loves, like she wants to be with Adora. Like, she wants to be back with Adora. Every other person in the show knows that. Every other person's like, Catcher, it's not that bad. She's just angry. Like, Scorpia knows it. Yes. Hordak knows it. Hordak Prime knows it. Everyone knows it. Except for Adora, apparently. <laughs> because Adora, kind of dumb. But we'll get into yeah. that, too. <laughs> okay, th- is this this is the spoiler line. Treat me so nice, baby. Spoil me. Right, we're mm-hmm. about what I'm doing. I'm doing these weird things with my hands that luckily you can't see. The spoiler line is here. I do also want to say, in addition to spoiling, uh, uh, is it spoiling or spoiling? Spoiling. <laughs> spoiling. Why did I add an extra <laughs> syllable there? <laughs> Shira, I also want to talk about Revolutionary Girl Utena. So we're going to talk about the end of that show a little bit. But I hope that you don't mind because maybe I'll be able to convince you to watch it if you haven't. So just okay. know we're going to talk about that. We have to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Line crossed, right? Line crossed. Yep. We like to start with first impressions, which is, you know, earlier in the other part, we talk about how did we get introduced to this character, but this is how the character first appears in their media because in a lot of cases these characters make really grand entrances and the entrance for Katra is literally three minutes into the show 
like almost immediately. They're like, this is Adora. This is your main character. This is who she is. And you're going to need to know who Catra is. Yeah. So Catra is like perched on a pillar because they're doing some kind of like, maybe you don't know this when you first start watching, but they're doing some kind of like simulation fight. And it almost mm. seems like Catra is one of the bad guys. And she's like stalking Adora. You're right. Yeah. And then Adora is fighting one of these robots that they're trading with and falls in a hole. And then Catra just walks over and she's like, hey, Adora, how's it hanging? <laughs> <laughs> Which is also the first time, but not the last time you're going to hear her say, hey, Adora, with that little purring voice. There must be like hundreds of scene collections of just like yes. Catra saying hey Adora for three minutes straight or something yes, like that. absolutely <laughs> also the way that she like takes out so right before this happens they mention Catra a lot like Adora is like where's Catra or like the training officers like Catra's late where is she and like so she's already kind of being hyped up even though it's literally mm -hmm. been a couple of minutes and then when she does show up, she just, like, gently kicks this robot <laughs> into the hole in, like, a really, like, it's not, like, a cool way. It's, like, <laughs> I, this isn't even, like, worth my time. Like, the yeah. gentlest, like, Ugh, I'm just gonna kick this in the whole thing. Yeah, she can't be bothered. Yeah, can't be bothered. I would say that this first impression, compared to a lot of the other ones that we talk about, it's, like, to me, like, so intentional. Like, some of the other people we, we talk about, like, they didn't know how big the character was going to be at the time. Or, like, mm -hmm. they didn't maybe, like, think about, I don't, like, an arc from, like, what's the first episode going to feel like to the last episode. But this one really felt like we're introducing her and she's going to be a, a, such a big deal. Like, the biggest of deals. Like, like they really, I think hype it even in a couple minutes and then like the dynamic is there like yeah because i mean the show really is about adora and katra yes we go through a few arcs of like the big bad and like all this stuff but it's always about it always comes back to adora and katra and they're always tipping the balance in one way or the other so i also okay i didn't end up making one of my game questions about this so i can mention this but originally when they devised She-Ra because they had He-Man and they were like, well, we need a toy for girls. So they, they devised She-Ra. Originally the writers created She-Ra and She-Ra's arch nemesis was Katra. And then they were like, well, we're going to merge She-Ra and He-Man and make sure they're in the same universe. So we're just going to have the same bad guy for both, which was like Hordak. Or I guess Hordak and uh, Skeletor or whatever. But they were like, okay, well, to make the bad guys, like, the same for both shows so people understand what's going on, we're just going to make it Hordak. And then Catra got demoted to being, like, second in command to Hordak. So mm -hmm. having Catra be so key in this show almost feels like it's, like, justice for Catra, you know? Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, you know, she's a really big deal in this first episode. We kind of mentioned it in the last, the spoiler free part when, you know, it really like this whole episode is like Adora finding out about the sword and about the rebellion and that they're the bad guys actually, and she needs to join the other side. But then, you know, like, she wants to bring Catra with her, and Catra's like, no, like, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, like, so essentially it's, like, even the whole introduction of the show is, like, you're gonna have to really care about this relationship. This is the key to to it all, which is yeah. very exciting. All right, that's that's all I had about that first impression. I don't know if you had other notes or if you want to move on. I think just the that first Hey Adora is just really key. I don't know that they knew that Hey Adora was going to be such a thing that first time. But after the voice actor delivered that line, I feel like once you heard that, it was like, well, this has to be said a million more times. <laughs> and there's even like a time where she's like, hey, Catra, right? Like there's yeah, a comeuppance. Yeah. Yeah. It's so cute. And, and even that part, like at the end... 
you know, Catra's like almost dying and she <laughs> looks up and she's like, hey, Adora. <laughs> I, yeah, it's such a running gag for sure. Okay, let's talk about her looks. A pretty face and personality. I mean, like, girl's got a lot of clothes, which is good. Yes. Um, yes. Definitely along the same line. Like, she's kind of got her main red villainess look. And then, like, in season four, there's, like, or season five is, like, this big crazy thing in space. So she ends up in this, like, spacesuit kind of stuff. I think, like, you know I want to talk about the prom. I'm just going to hold off we, just a oh, little okay. longer. I yeah, see. Like, we, I feel like mm -hmm. we got to talk about the the default before we get to prom. Yeah. So she's very cat-like. She's got the ears. She's got kind of, like, a mane of hair. I think one thing that people love is that she has, like, the two colored eyes. Okay, Katja's looks are, I mean, I love her outfits. Like you said, she has cat ears. She has claws on, on her feet and her hands. She has this, like, cute little, like, almost like, I don't know what it's supposed to be, but like it almost stripes, looks like scratches right? or, like, stripes. Yeah, but they're kind of, yeah. like, scratch, scratchy-looking stripes on her arms um, she has her signature red, red look and her mask, which is actually a callback to the original character. Yeah. So she has all these like little cutouts and stuff, you know, for yeah. the scratches. The mask is like a little, it's like a headband. Like she never wears it. It's literally just like an Easter egg for the original character, which I never, even though I didn't know anything about the original She-Ra, now that I think about it, it is kind of a weird design and it doesn't make it as much sense without knowing about the original character. I think it kind of looks like it's almost like designed to look like Shadow Weaver's mask in a way, like a oh. like a different version of that. That's how it comes across, I think. That does make sense. Cuz Shadow Weaver is kind of like their messed up mom figure, so yeah. The different colored eyes are like really cute because they're actually like not the the iris part, it's like the white of the eye is blue on one side and yellow on the other. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about like, if if you made a costume for Katra, like how would you even do that? Like, I know they make really big contacts that will like cover up more of your eye, but I think they're pretty uncomfortable yeah. to wear. I was going to bring that up. Is it safe to color your eyeball like no, temporarily? Don't no. make me tell you about the girl I know okay. who sharpied the inside of her contacts. No. Okay. No, not like that. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. And I'm not advocating ah. this. Please, nobody do this. No. I was just wondering. Okay. Anyway, cosplayers, catch your cosplayers, write in and let us know how you do the colored eyeballs. You know, I've been out of the cosplay scene for many years now, but. The ones that I have seen do Catra, one thing that they do that I think is super cute is a lot of them do the eyeshadow above in the different oh. colors, and it's, like, super pretty, and I think that's, like, a really cute way to do it. Plus, it's a lot safer for your eyes. Oh, extremely safe. Please don't do anything unsafe to your eyes. I'm sorry I said <laughs> it. You could also Photoshop it, like, yeah. which is fine, like, you know. There used to be, back in the old days of cosplay, it used to be like, if you photoshopped your, your photos, you were like impure or something, <laughs> which is like, yeah, but for some details, it, it's like, you're just, you're just zhuzhing it up a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. But yeah, definitely, there are so many pretty Shiro cosplayers, so oh, that's yeah. definitely worth checking out. Okay, so lots of good outfits. We have to talk about the tuxedo, because that okay. was the thing. That was mm -hmm. the thing in that Are They Gay episode. When I saw her in this tuxedo that's like red and burgundy and like the bow tie is open in the front. Yeah. And then he showed the moment where in the episode, like this really happens. She dips Katra and like the lighting changes and she's like, maybe I've already won or something like that. Mm -hmm. And Katra dips Adora. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Katra dips her during this dance, because of course they dance together. I mean, it's so, it's it's gay. Like, there's no, <laughs> there's no like, it's not straight. There, I don't even understand <laughs> how people would look at that and be like, mm, 
good friends. Like it's it's not possible. I don't think. You do know how it is, though, Miko, because all throughout history, you have these portraits of women who are literally, like, making out or having sex in this portrait. And they're like, this is a portrait of Lady Guinevere and her best friend. It's like, that's not her best friend. That's not her best friend. Check yourself. Your art history class sounds better than mine. <laughs> no, they didn't go over that in art. Well, I mean, a little bit. Yeah, so, like, if there's nothing else you see in this show, you will have to see the prom episode because just seeing the two of them dance angrily together and then, like, <laughs> the dip, I was just, like, completely shocked because another thing is, like, we know, okay, like, we know we get queer baited all the time. And if you don't know what that means, that's basically the... It means that it seems like two characters could be like a not straight match like there's a lot of tension between them but then nothing really happens and the reason why it gets talked about a lot is because in some countries um non-straight relationships are illegal or they're not allowed in pop culture so they they're they're often reluctant to lose money in those shows. Again, I, you know, to be honest, I don't actually know any of this for a fact. I just know from like people on YouTube being angry about it, but it makes sense to me, right? Yeah, it's like, no, I think that's a big, it's a big factor. They don't want to upset, yeah. they don't want to lose money in certain countries where it's censored. Or to be honest, even America, right? Like, oh yeah, yeah. They don't want to lose the conservative viewership, I guess, or get, yeah. get what do you call that when you boycotted? Yeah. So there's always like a lot of tension between people who think like that content shouldn't be in kids shows or shouldn't be in any show or and people who are like it's important to have representation because you know when people see themselves represented then they kind of know that they're normal like they're okay and that that's a huge deal. Like I feel that as like a biracial person who has like basically never seen anyone who looks like me in anything ever, you know? Yeah. It's like, so like, I just feel like it really is important to show different types of characters and different types of relationships because like it actually can save lives. Like, yeah. so what ends up happening is that this like hinted at like just enough for people to like make fanfic and fan art about it, but then it never delivers. So you get trained to the point where like you see something like a girl in a tuxedo romantically dipping another girl while the lighting changes and like it, it's like a sexy like, you know, they're enemies, but there's a lot of like eye contact and other contact going on. And you just think to yourself like, I mean, I don't want to get my hopes up. Like, yeah, I don't want to be burned again, because like at this point, it would probably be like the 20th show for me to watch. Oh, yeah. and be like, wow, these characters are going to get together. No, they aren't. You know? Um, yeah. There's just like, there's very little nuance to it, though. Like, it feels like there's very little nuance to. Yeah. To their relationship. Like, the only people who don't know that they love each other is them. Yeah, and, and arguably Catcher does know, but she she doesn't say anything till much later. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think she's willing to admit it to herself until the end. But okay, yeah, Princess Prom is a very special episode where, like, the episode, it seems like something that shouldn't be canon because it doesn't make any sense that Catcher's allowed to be at the prom. Right. But she is. So it's just like, it feels like fan fiction. Which is just really, I think it's really nice that it just is canon and it just is in yeah. there and it's, they don't over explain it. They're just like, here's <clears throat> this gift. We made you a gift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if that's the first episode that Scorpia is introduced to, but it's definitely like the first one where Scorpia is important because they're, they're basically just like, hey, this other character is a princess. So she's allowed to go to the prom and she's going to bring Catcher with her. And you're just kind of like, wait, what? Like, Scorpia, we'll talk about later, but it's like such a delight. And what I loved is like, it's not a character I expected to like. Like, I was like, okay, that's just like one of the other characters. But then she grows on you so much. 
And I feel like she has to be my favorite character. I can't, like, I can't imagine a world without, without Scorpia. Yeah, I think for me, she really, in the last season especially, was just, like, so special. Maybe the last two seasons. For sure. She really grew on me also. All right, back to Catra's clothing. The other one I wanted to especially point out was the cat suit that has ears. Sorry, the space suit. Mm -hmm. Much later, after a whole bunch of stuff goes down in season five, we finally get Catra's redemption arc. And after that, she gets to join the good guys. And for some reason, there's something where they like make spacesuits. Maybe it doesn't trap to make it. Yeah, and trap okay. to make spacesuits for everyone because they're on a spaceship and they land someplace. And everybody has these custom-made spacesuits. Yes, and of course, Catra's spacesuit includes little ears for her, little cat ears, which is like such an endearing, like it's a small moment, but it's so endearing because Catra's always been the evil nemesis. But now the the rest of the you know good guys have embraced her. And they're all just like, you're really adorable in your little spacesuit. And she's like, no, I'm not adorable. And they're like, yeah, you are. Look how cute you are. And it's yeah. like just like a really, it's like part of the healing process for her that like they're including her and like gently teasing her for being cute. Like it's so, yeah. it's just so special. Like it's wholesome. Yeah. So. She has to learn to, she has to learn to understand that them treating her that way is not them picking on her, but them accepting her. Right. Yeah. And yeah, that whole thing, she then proceeds to take off her spacesuit helmet, but she does it in the way that like a cat would try to get something off their head. So she's just standing there and then immediately like her foot is also on the helmet, like trying <laughs> to get it off. It's a good moment. Oh, yeah. I don't know if there's any particular outfits you wanted to call out now that I'm finished hyperventilating. Let me see. I mean, I just really like her base outfit, and it gets, like, a little bit of an upgrade, I think, after she becomes Horde Captain, and she has this little, like, one-arm thing going on, one-arm one yeah. arm covered. That's probably my favorite one. And, like, boob cut out in the front. <laughs> yeah. That's, like, after the time skip, I guess. She gets that, or maybe that's even later. I don't know when that one is. But yeah, I really, I really like her outfits. I think she has the best outfits. Yeah, she's really cute. And then, of course, she gets the haircut. We don't, do we get to see the hair get cut during that? Or is it just like when we see her again, it is short? No, the haircut happens after Horde Prime chips her. Okay. Her hair is short after that. So, like... I, at the risk of sounding dumb, because like again, I'm just paraphrasing, and I'm not like an anime like scholar, but it usually like when the hair is cut in an anime, it's like a real symbolic moment, which represents like basically evolving into something else. So like there'll be like a character. <laughs> if you know, if you comment and you know exactly what anime this is, I'll be really impressed. But um, it's like. Uh, someone who has long hair and kept it long because like the guy she liked likes it long but then it accidentally gets cut in like a fight but then she keeps it short because like that's her real personality like there's like always these symbolisms like that so I don't know like we didn't get to see it's not like it was Catra's choice to cut the hair short but it does sort of mark a moment where like after She's brainwashed and then comes back from that. She's a good guy now, right? So it always kind of stays that way from then on. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. It definitely is a big shift, like, after she cuts her hair. But mm -hmm. I didn't, like, consciously put that together. But it makes a lot of sense. Or maybe they just thought it'd be cute, which it is. So, <laughs> like, no complaints over here. There's probably somebody who put that put that thought into it right because it's oh yeah it seems like it's initially kind of like a conformity thing when she's with the hordak clones and everything and she's chipped so it makes her silhouette i guess look a little more like them even though she's like way shorter than any of the hordak clones but mm -hmm. then after that it's just like a whole new haircut 
Yeah, and then there's this one moment where they, it's like I'm just literally like, and we're gonna talk about everything. Um, there's <laughs> this is it. There's this one moment where Shira's like, or Adora's like, imagining a future that she wants, and it's kind of implied that her and Catcher are like married, or like they're definitely like in love, and they're like much older. And it's really impressive how with like just a few changes, they look a lot older in that scene. Like they look like not teenagers anymore. And they're very cute in it too. Yeah. She has like a cute like collared shirt or something going on. Oh yeah. And her hair is like mid-length. It's like yet yeah, another. Oh yeah. Oh my God. I love her little half, her little like shoulder jacket. I, I yeah. feel bad for having been a costumer and not knowing what that's called but it's like a decorative jacket that you like purposely wear like on one side or like a cape or something it's so cute yeah that was like such a really nice costume design even though it was like only in there for a little bit it was such an important moment yeah and especially because the color like she has her red like signature red but then the jacket is like a door, like she kind of yeah. colors with like the white and the gold. Yeah, and, and I, I just... don't. <laughs> it's just so good. <laughs> There's just nothing else to say about it. It's too good. Yeah, I feel like we keep just being like, oh, that's really good. Oh, that's good. But <laughs> what else do you say about it? It's feels, it's the feelings. <laughs> I saw earlier today, like someone from the show said that in that scene that like Catra's wearing a little emblem from Shira's outfit and Shira Dora's wearing an out a little emblem from Catra's outfit. And they said that that's something that they purposely did with all the married couples. So it is supposed to be that they're married in that <gasps> scene. Wait, so wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. So apparently it would be like Glimmer's parents would have the same and then Natasa and is it Spinarella? Spinarella, yeah. They're married too, yeah. Wait, now I need to go back and watch that scene though, because there's a moment between Bo and someone else, and I was like, are they together? Bo and Glimmer. Is it Bo and Glimmer? Yeah, Bo and Glimmer, Bo and Glimmer 100% Glimmer. get together. Okay, 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 okay. Do they give something? Oh, well, they must be, if you're saying that every married couple has like these like yeah shared elements i bet i can go back and look and find it which like i that was another one where i didn't know they were gonna get together i didn't know if they were just really 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 good friends i mean like there definitely were moments where like glimmer was jealous and stuff but mm -hmm. i just wasn't sure are we actually gonna go there and seal the deal and be like yeah they're in love with each other because Bo is like kind of he's like really likable and seemed to be like equally caring about like everybody so I didn't read too much into him and Glimmer until it was like oh th this is gonna happen oh wait okay I think I found a screenshot of it so he his jacket has like a purple sparkly part on it because like her hair always has like the sparkly part so I yes. think that must be it Oh my gosh. How exciting. Okay, sorry. It's like, <laughs> okay, I'm back. All right. Like, this is the part of the podcast where you just listen to us look at fan art together. All right. Well, I had to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, personality wise, yeah. I feel like we have talked a lot, but like, the gist is she's basically a cat, right? She's feisty mm -hmm. and she complain complains a lot, but like, she secretly loves you. She, like, scratches and lashes out, you know, verbally and physically when she's scared. She's um, very, um, what do you, I, I don't know why I can't think of words anymore. But, like, she retaliates a lot. She holds a grudge. Vindictive. Vindictive. That was yes. the word I was looking for. And they, you know, the way she's animated is, like, so cat-like all the time. I also read a thing that, like, when they were horde soldiers... She would sleep curled up at the base of Adora's bed, which is like, I mean, <laughs> best friends, am I right? Best friends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, personality-wise, she's so sad. Like, she's so... Tragic. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, oh, you just watch her make these bad decisions over and over again, and you know she's going to regret it. Mm-hmm. She is definitely this type of character that, like, I really love. Like, one of my secret kryptonite 
character types, which is like the the woman that loves somebody but is a villain and doesn't expect them to ever get together, but will still kind of like secretly take care of that person. Like, like not so much. She definitely just lashes out more so than that character trope I just described. Oh, so are you talking about Ada Wong? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we're talking about Ada Wong, or we will soon. Ada, like, well, we can't get too into it, but she she's definitely more like that. Catra, like, she is the big bad for a lot of this. Like, she does really bad stuff. But that little element of, like, I don't think she ever really expected Adora to return her feelings and was just like ex- like going to pine forever, you know? And like that's the part that I'm like, "Oh, no, it's like too it's too much for me." Like, yeah. <laughs> well, and it also comes from a place for her of like she doesn't feel worthy. She doesn't yes. feel like she's good enough. So, like, of course she loves Adora, but Adora is never going to love her back because she's not worth anything. Like, she can't join the good guys because she's not good enough. And, like, she's done bad things and they'll never accept her. And it's, yes. it's from such a sad place. Oh, Katra. <laughs> like, Yeah, and uh, it's actually really amazing, too. I mean, I wasn't in the fandom and we just binged it all at once. But even from, like, us just binging the show... After, like, I think season three and then again in season four, you had these moments where you're like, how are they going to redeem her? Because, like, usually, like, that's a delicate line. Like, if you make a villain go too far, then the audience can't recover from that. Like, they, you know, it's really hard for them to be back on board. And I wanted her to be redeemed, but I'm like, how are they going to do it? Like, she did some pretty mean stuff. And then if I remember correctly, I think her biggest moment was like saving Glimmer when they were on the spaceship with no expectation. Like she was like, don't worry about me. I don't matter. You get out of here. Tell Adora not to come save me. Yes. And and that seemed like, I mean, I get chills just even thinking about it. Yeah, she would care. Oh, that she cared so much about Glimmer, who she barely knew, because she knows that Glimmer's important to Adora and important to their their world, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but it all comes down to self a self-worth issue. And, like, all the bad decisions she makes are either because she doesn't think she's worth anything, or she thinks if she goes through with this that she could be worth something to someone. And that's how she ends up trying to impress, like, Hordak. But yeah, I think that's a big turning point is when she saves Glimmer. And that's like, that's the real start of her redemption arc is is her like being friends with Glimmer on the ship because she realizes that she and Glimmer are in the same position because there's nothing Catra can do that's going to make her safe on that yeah. ship. And then like some of the worst things that Catra did is like sending Entrapta to the Beast Island. That yes. was that was the worst because she even she told Hordak that she ran away. Oh yeah. And I mean the whole thing with Entrapta was like really fucked up because she told Entrapta that her friends left her, but her friends thought that she was dead. Like her friends yeah. thought that she got crushed under rubble or something when a building collapsed. And then yeah. she's like she manipulated Entrapta into being like, Well, listen, your friends don't care about you. Like you thought you understood that they liked you, which is like Especially insidious because it's playing on like entrapped as like neurodivergence of like not understanding social cues. Entrapped is like a really special character too. Like <laughs> she's really adorable. Yeah, I love Entrapped. She manipulates her. She and then when she feels like Hordak trusts Entrapped too much and she's gonna get replaced as like being Hordak's number one, she sends. Entrapped at a beast island, which is supposed to be this terrible place that no one comes back from and everyone dies. And it's like a horrible, like torturous place, which jokes on her because Entrapta loves it. Because <laughs> it's just like robots and stuff she hasn't seen. Yeah, I mean, we're probably going to touch on it more too, but like 
the number of times that there is a character where I'm like, well, they're not going to make that character likable. That would be impossible. And then, like, it happens. <laughs> like, the whole, like, romance between Entrapta and Hordak is, like, you're just like, no, you can't make this work. But then suddenly it is working. And you're like, what? What's wrong with me? Why am I okay with this? <laughs> like, yeah, that was, I actually put that, I had that, Oh, I didn't have that under Conspiracy Corner. I was like, that's one thing that I wrote down while I was watching. I was like, wait, is Hordak have a crush on Entrapta? Is that what I'm taking from this? Oh, like, yeah. Like, the power of love brings him back from his, like, clone brainwashing. And at first I was like, oh, he's just remembering, like, his most, like, intense plan. And then I was like, no, this is, like, beyond that. This is, like, he really likes Entrapta. He's into Entrapta. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure of it. They had a, they have a thing going on. Yeah, definitely. All right. And then the other note we had about personality was just the whole damaged goods thing. It's like, oh, we yeah. talked a little bit about it, but... I mean, maybe also I shouldn't have written it that way because that's a little... It's like how she's meant to feel about herself, not that she actually is. You know? That's how she does feel about herself, yeah. but that's not how she is, and that's not a way anyone should feel. But she, yeah, that's that's what drives like all of her decisions. Yeah, and a lot of it comes from that abusive nature from Shadow Weaver, who again mm -hmm. is like the terrible mom figure, right? Um, yeah. Oh my god, there's another character that it was like, how are they going to make Shadow Weaver okay? And in the end, you okay. Actually, the moment that gave me the most goosebumps is when Shadow Weaver takes off her mask and then, like, sacrifices herself to fight that monster. I really? was like, yes, yes, yes. It was a big deal. I really like Shadow Weaver. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh my god, that's what she looks like under there. Like, I feel like that one was, if I remember, it wasn't as, I felt like I couldn't totally redeem her because i was so upset i know we're going to talk more about shadow weaver later yeah we will but but i mean like it was really impressive for them to take that character that far yeah you know because she had done so much bad stuff to the our main characters oh yeah yeah i mean she did irreversible trauma to adora and katra like they might be able to work through it and be happy but the way that she hurt them during such a formative time of their life. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that never totally goes away, you know? Yeah. And I do think one of the things that they touch on, which is a really hard topic, you know, is like, just like, it's not black and white. It's like everybody who's a villain is like, there's good in there too, right? And it's hard because it's like, you don't want to keep yourself in real life. You don't want to put yourself in an abusive relationship if you can help it, right? Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes it's also okay to acknowledge that, like, you got out of a bad situation and it's okay that you still have fondness for that person or that there were moments where they made you happy, you know, even if yeah. ultimately it's not the right thing for you. Or that you understand, like, why they made some of the decisions that they made. It doesn't make it okay, but right. you can look back and be like, well, this wasn't okay and this really was bad for me or other people but i do understand like how they got there you know yeah yeah absolutely moving on Think your relationship material. is catra relationship material go I, okay we're screaming about catra we love catra but also if we're being realistic no like catra <laughs> needs to like she needs to go to therapy. She needs to do some work on herself because she hurts a lot of people. Her self-esteem causes her to lash out at everyone who's nice to her. Up until the, the very end, I guess. It, the only thing that like saves it for me is like that glimpse into the future where they're like happy yes. together. And it's like, okay, that's a healthy Katra that yeah. would be a great looks like they would be a great partner. To be honest, for most of the show, she's very hurtful. She just hurts everyone. Yeah. She hurts Scorpia. She hurts yeah. Adora. She hurts Entrapta. She hurts everyone. She hurts Hordak. Like, everyone. 
I think she's like definitely like a not yet character. Like when yeah. you see where she is by the end of the series and we presume that they're going to be happy ever after at the end of the series, it's like that's part of the healing process for her. And that's why I like the moments like with the spacesuit where I think she does say something like, I am trying to like, she's yeah. also like, I am trying to learn how to be nice, you know? And then she like tries to repeat it, but like in a nicer way or something. Yeah, she says something that does seem like it's something that someone says after they've gone to therapy, I guess the rebellion must have therapists or something. Because she's <laughs> like, I'm trying to acknowledge when I'm getting angry or something like that. So yeah, you already see her kind of on that healing process. And that doesn't mean that people who are having like out of control emotions or anything don't deserve love. It's just like, that's not a good time for a stable relationship, you know? Yeah, like you need to work hard to, you know, you yeah. can all learn to change even if we've been through really hard stuff. Yeah. And yeah. And so it's like you see her on that path to becoming a better person and we're rooting for her and we think she's going to get there, you know? But like during what we see in the show, like, yeah, she's really mean to Scorpia and Entrapta, who are two very likable characters. Like to see anybody be mean to Scorpia is just like kicking a puppy. Like you can't. You can't have that, you know? Yeah. So so definitely I see where you're coming from. I'm going to give this one a not yet because I'm rooting for her. I do think based on the way the series ends, like her and Adora will be fine. Um, obviously, they're incredibly like matched to each other. So I don't think they're, they're I think they're going to be together. Like they're not going to divorce, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Well, they understand, they understand each other's trauma, right? Like, they understand what they went through because they had a similar upbringing. Yes, and I do think that's actually a really special thing about Adora, too, is, like, how in that last season, they really dived into how, like, her need to sacrifice herself was, like, really harmful. Like, her need to protect everybody by, by inwardly taking all of this pain and stuff was going to not be the best for everyone but she didn't realize that and at the time that she can't turn into she-ra it's actually more dangerous for everyone because she's going in and trying to be a martyr and like not being yeah. able to like pull it off at all so then everyone else is in danger because they have to go save her over and over and over again yeah totally so i do think it's like a relationship that needs work but i think they're they're gonna work on it and yeah uh, wait you know. i want to say one more thing about it yeah so like the thing about like the reason that i i consider katra and adora to be like are we allowed to say this faded mates like they're like ma they're soulmates right they're like made for each other and i think part of that is because they have to both be there at the end when Adora has to do the like fail safe thing on the heart of Etheria. Yes. Because Adora is always willing to sacrifice herself for everyone else because in her mind, that's like the only way. She's like, yeah. I'll sacrifice myself and no one else will get hurt. But because Katra doesn't think she's, Katra thinks that she herself is like not worthy of anything. To her, it's completely unacceptable that Adora would sacrifice herself because yeah. she loves Adora. And, like, Adora needs to survive. And Adora should be yeah. in the world. And, like, the fact... They both have to be there at the end so that they both can come out. Yeah. I think that's so special. Like, completely. And then, like, not as... Like, what you said was, like, so poetic. So what I'm about to say is, like, not that good <laughs> in comparison. <laughs> but I did just want to bring up again, like, Adora's, like, doesn't come across as very smart. <laughs> and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's actually cool to show characters that have flaws. And one of her flaws is like she seems to be like overly optimistic and like get tricked a lot throughout the series. And that's one of those moments where like she's just thinking too simplistically about how this all will end. And then there's just like a couple of really key moments where like, you know, 
Catra gets to say, you're such an idiot. And it's like, I think that's really special too, to be like, I, I don't know how to say it, but it's like, not everybody has to be a genius. You know, you can still be a hero and be like a good person without being like a complete brainiac. And I think that's really cool that Adora is one of those characters who's like, obviously a hero, but like has some shortcomings. And one of them is that she doesn't think through some of the evil plans that are happening around her. Yeah, because it's like a strength and a weakness, right? Because basically her heart is so big that she can't stand it that she could do anything that would keep someone else from getting hurt. Yeah. Right? But some she doesn't think it through. But it's also like, that's also a strength that she's so, she wants so badly to like invest in people and like help them and everything. Because that's the reason why she and Katra are good for each other or like perfect for each other because Katra is hard to love even as a child, right? Katra is not friends with anyone but Adora, even though Katra like scratches her face and tells her to go away, Adora just keeps coming back. And like Adora's the only one who could get get through her her hard shell because in her mind it's like everyone's worth saving. Yeah, totally. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. See, it's deep. <laughs> yeah. If people are going to watch like the first episode of the show and be like, how did they get so deep <laughs> about this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, next up, if we're done with that, is game time. Game time. Try to ignore me, play your Okay, game time. My game is called I'm My Original Character, oh, which is a reference to a really, an old, like, early internet meme video. <laughs> so if anybody <laughs> okay. knows what that is, I'll send it to you afterwards, Miko. It is completely unrelated to anything, but it's burned into my brain forever because I grew up on the internet. All so... Right. Yeah, this is like an original She-Ra versus reboot She-Ra quiz called I'm okay. My Original Character. So the Catra we've been talking about today is from She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, which is a 2018 reboot of an existing property from 1985. So I prepared this quiz where I'm going to quiz you on the original character of the 1985 series in okay. contrast to the character that you know. I probably know nothing. I think I maybe watched like one five minute video once just to be like, oh, look, that's what they all looked like. I, <laughs> I fell into a big rabbit hole researching all this for the show because I found it so interesting how much they pulled from the original show, but also what was different that I, I just like, I couldn't stop looking at that like hours I spent. <laughs> Just looking at that stuff. Okay, so question one. Oh, so like the original show I'm calling Original She-Ra and the show okay. like Princesses of Power, I'm calling Reboot She-Ra. So those are our two. So in Reboot She-Ra, Catra's one true love and faded mate is Adora. In Original She-Ra, Catra's significant other is... Answer one. She didn't have a significant other. Answer two. Skeletor. Answer three, Seahawk. Answer four, Hordak. Oh my gosh. I'm just going to guess Hordak because she's like, in. I'm guessing, aligned with him. Okay, so there's actually two right answers, but Hordak was not one of them. So oh no. <laughs> Catra didn't actually date anyone in the 1985 series as far as I can tell, but she did think that Seahawk would want to get with her because she was oh, like, no. I'm Katra. Like, why wouldn't you? But <laughs> but Seahawk was actually with Adora, which made Katra even more mad. In the original series, Seahawk and Adora are a pair. Oh my gosh. That's yeah. hard to imagine. Yeah. I don't know if we're talking about Seahawk later, but I just wanted to again mention that he is voiced by Jordan Fisher, who is like this amazing person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is 
if he's Matt in my one of my favorite video games, Until Dawn, but is probably better known for like his music and being in a lot of movies and stuff. So that that's a pairing I wouldn't have expected. Yeah, the two right answers were she didn't really date anyone, but she did want to get with Seahawk. She wanted to get with the Seahawk. Okay. Yeah. Good gravy. Next question. In Reboot She-Ra, Catra befriends a shape-shifting space cat named Milog. Who was Milog in the original She-Ra? Option one, Milog was a shape-shifting person made of mud. Option two, Milog didn't exist in original She-Ra. Option three, Milog was the name of Catra's cat form. Oh, I feel like it. they must have existed because you mentioned how elaborate they were with like all the easter eggs so i'm gonna go with the shape-shifting person that is correct that's correct me log was Yay. a shape-shifting person made of mud ew <laughs> also a uh, fun fact me log is golem spelled backwards oh okay yeah that makes sense mud person golem yeah <laughs> Okay, next question. In Reboot She-Ra, Catra is a cat person with some human and cat features and abilities. Catra's original character, option one, was Sira, the magical pet cat of He-Man who was captured accidentally by Horde soldiers during an attack. The magical cat was magically experimented on by Shadow Weaver and gained a human form. That's option one. Whoa. Okay. Option two was a human who may or may not have magical powers and uses the mask stolen from the magic cat queen of Half Moon to transform between a human and cat form. That's option two. What the hell? All right. Option three. Had no physical cat characteristics. Her nails were sharp and her voice had a lot of purrs in it. This was never explained. I mean, like, if you made up two of those, then you have put a too much time into this quiz. <laughs> Um, I think it was, those are like really specific backstories. I feel like it was three because I don't know that they would have put as much time into it as you just did. <laughs> that she's just like a woman who's like kind of cat-like, but mm -hmm. tell me. The answer is number two. Number two? The original character of Catra was a human which I put in quotes because she's from another planet. Okay, yeah, yeah A yeah. human who may or may not have magical powers and uses the mask stolen from the magic cat queen of Half Moon to transform between a human and cat form. Like, who's the magical cat queen? Like, why isn't she Catra? <laughs> <laughs> There's actually an episode called Magic, magic Cats, and She-Ra and Catra, I watched this one on YouTube. I think it's one of the ones available from the official He-Man and She-Ra account, YouTube account. So they fall into a crack in Eternia's surface. And when they fall into the crack, they fall to a city called Half Moon, which is where the magic cats live. And the magic cats are missing their queen because at the beginning of the show... The mask that Hordak gives Catra is the Magic Cat Queen's mask, which gives her all these extra powers, like unlimited magical powers. Like, we don't even know all the powers that the mask has. Oh my god. So she, they fall there, and she's able to convince them that she's their queen because she has the mask. Okay. <laughs> because she can turn into a cat. But anyway. That's a lot. Like... Yeah. Yeah, and that was just one episode where they were like, you're our queen because our queen's missing. It's like, yeah, your queen's missing because Hordak has her in prison and gave her special mask to Catra. But the original queen is a cat? Yeah, all the magic cats seem to just be like anthropomorphized cat people. Like, think more like Aristocats and less Catra. <laughs> yeah, there's a all lot, right. there's a lot right. going on there. I'll just accept that, okay? Yeah, yep. Oh, yeah, and then I said she is from another planet, but she does look like everyone else, which in the Masters of the Universe universe, I guess, raises questions about human propagation. Like, why are there humans on every planet? I don't know. Anyway, next question. Are you having fun, Miko? Yes, I am. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's wild. All right. Next question. 
The reboot Katra, we all know and love, is voiced by AJ Mashaka of Ali and AJ fame. Did you know no. this? Yes. No! Yes. Wait, I like Ali and AJ. Go on. Okay. I'm like quietly Googling things. I thought you would love that. Okay, so... Wait, but did you know I like Ali and AJ? No one ever wants to talk about them. No, but I figured that you might because... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> they have this one song that I listen to all the time on my playlist. <laughs> oh no! Okay. Okay, well now you know. So AJ Mushaka of Ali and AJ fame is the voice of Reboot Katra. She also voiced Devani and Steven Universe and was Lainey Lewis and the Goldbergs, among other things. She has like a pretty robust voice acting and acting portfolio. So that's Reboot Katra. Original Catra was voiced by Melanie Britt. Which of the following is Melanie Britt also known for? Oh boy. Option one Batgirl and Catwoman in the 1977 New Adventures of Batman. Option two Grand Grand in 2005 Avatar The Last Airbender, the TV show. Oh my gosh. Option three, voicing almost every female character in the 1985 She Ra, including Adora. <laughs> Option four, Princess Aura and Queen Freya and Liza from 1979 Flash Gordon. I mean, I guess I'll just go for the funniest option, which is C, she's everybody. So the answer is all of the above. <laughs> she's also a very prolific voice actor. And she was almost every female character in 1985 She-Ra and some non-female characters, like some of the like Gosh. talking animals and stuff which i think i had no idea like i watched some clips i just didn't know i i had to, it didn't occur to me at all that that would be the case oh my god um so she, yeah she was in the original she was adora catra castispella mermista and 12 other named characters in the show i mean <laughs> I guess, like, that's one way to save on staff, but, like, she still has to do all the- Like, I don't even know if you're really saving anything. She just still has to do everything. That's interesting. Well, I mean, back in those days, it probably was saving them money. That's impressive if they really sounded different, you know? Yeah, I I mean, it didn't occur to me, but I'm also not, like, a voice acting expert, so. But, yeah, I thought it was great, and also both of these women have, like, very impressive portfolios and i just picked out a few things that they're known for but very talented um and kudos to both of them well if anyone wants to hear a good ally and aj song because i actually don't <laughs> know like anything about them except that this one song and i guess they're disney kids which is why you guessed i knew them right yep it's the song chemicals react that's my jam okay i'll make sure to listen to it later <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, last question. In Reboot She-Ra, Catra has some nicknames and titles from other characters, like Force Captain, Scorpio calls her Wildcat, Double Trouble always calls her Kitten, Horde Prime calls her Little Sister, and Glimmer, uh, for a time, refers to her as Horde Scum. In the original She-Ra, Catra is her villain name, but the character's actual name is... Option one, Sarah of Dilaruth the third. Option two, Esmeralda of Mysticor. Option three, Alasia of Selenius. What on earth? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to, what was the second one? I feel like I'm going with that one. Esmeralda of Mysticor. I mean, that's like a very magical name. So I'm going to go with that one. Okay, the answer is actually Sira of Dilaruth three or Dilaruth the third. The third. So she has. That's the name of the planet, I guess. So maybe it would be Dilaruth three. Oh, okay. I don't know. It's Dilaruth and then the Roman numeral three. I don't know how you're supposed to say it. Yeah, that's her actual name. Like when you look at the wiki for Masters of the Universe, which is very extensive, that's her actual name. Why she's called Catra, I don't know. Maybe she only gets called Catra after she gets her cat mask. I'm not sure. So there is an answer, probably. Maybe that's why the names are so literal, is they're like your title. Maybe. 
I mean, He Man. Like, <laughs> it starts at the beginning, you know? Like, yeah, no, it does. It does. I'll just tell you Esmeralda of Mysticor is cast as Bella, and Mysticor actually is featured prominently in the plot of the reboot, also, because that's also where Shadow Weaver's from. Um, and it's also where King Micah studied magic. Yes. Yeah, I remember. Um, and it's also where the the Amazing. failsafe was that they had to go get, I think. The last um, option, Elysia of Selenius, is Mermista's. Oh, right. Is she still from Selenius in the reboot? I believe so. Like, I feel like her queendom or whatever is, like, named more because there's a lot about protecting it in the first few seasons or something yeah okay also fun fact when the princesses go undercover to find pika blue who actually ends up being double trouble in the reboot the names they use are their actual character names from the original Sira. uh Sira. i did it she-ra <laughs> the original <laughs> she-ra oh right which i thought was really fun yeah, yeah. Okay. okay so that's the that's the end of the game you got like one. Yeah, I didn't do very well. <laughs> yeah, one out of five you got right. Nice. Yeah. Well, I'll take it. It wasn't really about getting the right answers. This was really just a vehicle for me to dump a, a small amount of the now original she rod knowledge that I have <laughs> in my brain. Have you seen how weird all this stuff is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just peek behind the curtain just a little bit. <laughs> It's all just a little bit weird. Yeah. Okay. So my game is called Does My Catra Love Me? And <laughs> as you know, the internet is full of lots of useful information, including quizzes. And mm -hmm. somebody on Pro Props Quizzes, which I'm sure is a very <laughs> reputable and well researched website just throwing them shade for no reason <laughs> has this cat does my cat love me 10 question quiz so we're going to do a little role play where you from adora's perspective mm -hmm. answer these questions about your cat catra about my catra about your catra okay and we'll find out how much your catra loves you okay all right question one does your cat run towards you as soon as you reach home? Never. It just lays there. Sometimes or every time. Uh, I'm going to go with never. The cold shoulder. Yeah. I can't think of a time when they were home that Katra ran towards Adora. Me, Adora. I feel like Adora <laughs> always had to go to Katra. Yeah, it could also be like just if they see each other, is Catra like hiding from her, or is she like rushing over there to cause some some mayhem? Yeah, the answer is either no or my cat just lays there. Probably just no. I would say no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Never got it. Never. Do you let your cat outside to play and explore? One, my Catra basically lives outside. Two, my Catra goes in and out as it pleases. Three, no way. Or four, on occasion. I mean, the answer is two. Because our Catra <laughs> is a person. <laughs> Can't be tamed. Yeah. Cannot be contained. All right. Question three. In your opinion, how much does your Catra like you? I mean, you can choose what part of the series you want to be at. One, my Catra hates me. Two, I think my Catra likes me most of the time. Three, my Catra likes me a lot. Or four, I am my Catra's best friend. Well, four is accurate. True. Period. But one is also accurate for most of the show. I mean, at the end of the show, it's four again. But for most of the show, it's one. I don't know what to pick. I mean, I feel like... If I pick one, then the answer to the quiz is just, no, your cat doesn't like you. <laughs> like, <laughs> where do we go from here? Well, we have we have seven more questions. So should I just be honest? I think we can pick one. We'll say one. Question four. Does your catra give you love bites? 
<laughs> and one, no, just real bites. Two, nope. Three, it licks me sometimes. This is not a romance podcast. <laughs> <laughs> or four, yes. Probably real bites. I, yeah, I don't know if she actually does. I think that would be fine. Yes. I, I guess I was thinking metaphorically. Yes. There's definitely a lot of clawing. I think there actually is real clawing. Right? There is real clawing. There's definitely yeah. real clawing. But I guess I was extrapolating, extrapolating yes. it metaphorically. <laughs> like, does your cat use its its weapons, its, like, yes. God-given weapons to hurt, actually hurt you? Yeah. Or pretend to hurt you or not hurt you at all you know yeah and the answer is it's it's trying to hurt you yeah she's she's trying to hurt you yeah these aren't these aren't love bites these are real bites agreed okay question five does your cat sleep near you one my cat stays as far away from me as possible two occasionally three at least once a day for every night and day this is another hard one because most of the show, they're apart. Yeah. But when they were together, like at the beginning... They did sleep together, yeah. Yeah, right. Let's just say once a day. All right. I don't know how this one's going to be answered. All right. Question six. Do you buy your catcher expensive or cheap food? One, whatever's on sale. Two, expensive food only. Three, I buy moderately priced cat food. Or four, I cook my catcher's meals. Um, that's really hard one because there's not a lot of food happening. The only one I can remember is like, don't doesn't like Glimmer make them dumplings in the last season? Yeah, they like all eat dumplings together or something. Yeah, <laughs> but what does that have to do with this? I mean. I don't remember Adora ever cooking. I don't think Adora knows how to cook. Yeah. I get the strong feeling that they eat slop in the horde camps. <laughs> There's like ration bars or something, right? Yeah. So maybe just going for like the cheap food option is good. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's that's Adora's priority to, to get Catra's affection with food. Okay. If you thought that one was hard. Oh God, I'm scared. Question seven. How often do you change your catcher's litter box? <laughs> what? One, when it overflows. Two, once a week. Three, every day. Or four, my catcher uses the toilet. Four. <laughs> as far as we know, it's yeah. four. I don't want to read that fanfic. <laughs> Question eight. We're almost there. Does your catcher purr when you are near? One, growling, purring, same thing, right? Two, not very often. Three, sometimes. Four, the unfortunately named like a motorboat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so again, going into the metaphorical, go, just go with me on a journey. Uh huh. Catra's purring is Heyadora. I, I'm there. And she does it every time she sees Adora. Every time. So I wouldn't say like a motorboat, but what was the affirmative one that was not that much? Probably sometimes. Sometimes? Yeah. Because she says other stuff. Okay. Sometimes. <laughs> okay. Question nine. How often do you groom and pamper your Catra? Okay. One, never. Two, once a month or less. Three, every week or four, every day. Never? I don't <laughs> know. I mean, I guess in accuracy wise would be never, but did someone brush her hair or something? No, but it wasn't Adora. I think she got wet once, but it was not, uh, that was like an accident. That wasn't a pampering moment. It's not like they're going to the spa. <laughs> like... No, no one's going to the spa. All right, so it's never. She's on her own. Yeah. Run. No, this cat, this quiz is going to tell us that our catcher hates us. I just know it. All right, last question. Do you play with your catcher? A lot of these are like loaded questions. <laughs> yes. Too. Like accidentally a suggestive. 
Very loaded. Do you play with your Catra? Number one, mm -hmm. my Catra attacks me. Does that count? Number two, my Catra doesn't really play. Number three, I try to. And number four, every day. I'm really torn between the first two. My cat attacks me. Does that count? And <laughs> my Catra doesn't really play because you know Catra doesn't really play. <laughs> I don't know. We'll go with one because that's just, it's just true. It's just true. It's just true. All right. We got your cat doesn't like you. <laughs> blah, blah. <laughs> Big surprise. Despite your best attempts, your cat just doesn't like you. Give it some space, good food and treats, and maybe it'll warm up to you eventually. How about, so they didn't recommend sacrificing yourself to save the universe? Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? Yeah, because that's really what did the trick, so... I don't think this quiz is canon. No. But... But it's a, it's a journey. Hey, Adora being purring is canon, though. Yes. And also, like, you know, it's a journey. Like, if it had been at the end of the se series or at the beginning, we would have gotten a higher rating. Yeah. I, I think in my head canon that Adora took this quiz at some point in the middle of the show uh -huh. and was like, oh, yeah, my catcher hates me. Yes, and then just believed that the whole time. Yeah, that's why she thought that. That's fair. All right, we're ready for the, like, highly talked about section <laughs> top and bottom moment. Because <laughs> um, it's not always the top five, and there's not always a bottom. Mm -hmm. So it's top and bottom moment. I'll be the to your top. Yeah, top and bottom moments. I don't understand the problem, Miko. <laughs> I have five top and two bottom. And because usually I do the entire thing based on the character, and you do the entire thing based on the whole series, I tried really hard to make it about the whole series this time. <laughs> Sorry, guess what? Guess what? You Mine's switched? just about Catra. <laughs> Good. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. I can do three bottom and three top. Okay. So let's do the bottoms first. <laughs> Shit. Someone's <laughs> going to quote that forever. All right. Okay. You go first because you have three. Okay. The bottom of my worst things list. Again, I like... I've prefacing this with like I like this thing so this is like yes it, it was hard for me to have three worst the bottom, things so, the bottom list is usually <laughs> like not that bad it's just like we're really scraping the barrel to find something to say yeah we're we're always like super positive the bottom of my bottom list is the short haircut I didn't like it just catch a short haircut oh you prefer the big hair yeah, I like her big hair. As as a, a fellow big hair girl, I was like, man, get that big hair bit. I like the ponytail. I like the older ponytail look, too. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have any thoughts about that. Makes sense to me. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, <laughs> so the, the second of my bottom two it is the horse. <laughs> oh, yeah. Swift wind, which is like, I mean, if he works for you, that's fine. It's just like, it's a lot. It's a lot to handle. I guess I'm not a horse girl. No, I'm not a horse girl. I'm not a My Little Pony girl. And I don't, I just, yeah, I, that swift wind and just like the, the comedy that Swift Wind represents in She-Ra is why it was kind of hard for me to get through the first three seasons of She-Ra. And it's not, it's just not for me. But also, like, this is a show for kids. Yeah. And, like, I hope kids get a big kick out of Swift Wind. But as an adult watching <laughs> this show, don't really like Swift Wind. I agree with you. I do have a favorite talking horse, which is, like, the show I watched a lot growing up in the 80s was Rainbow Bright. Oh, and mm -hmm. she has a talking horse that has a rainbow mane. And he's like really clever in the movie and stuff. Rainbow Bright and the Star Stealer, a very good movie that I would still watch to this day. 
and have a lot of feelings about. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's that's a really good horse that talks. That is, and he sings too. Wow, he really does it all. Wow. All right. Okay. Well, Swift Wind, watch out. Uh, Rainbow Bright's <laughs> horse is coming for you. Oh, yeah. What is the name? Starlight, I think. Anyway. Okay. The second thing on my worst things list, I guess I kind of already said, but like the early part of the show is so cutesy and light. I just, I ended up falling off of it and then not finishing the series. Oh, like yeah. I started watching when it came out <clears throat> and I watched maybe like the first two or three seasons maybe halfway through the third season. And then I didn't finish it until we decided we were doing it for the podcast. And I was like, well, I better yeah. finish this. And then I was really like delightfully surprised because the end of the show gets like more, a little more like serious, a little more dark. Um, and I just like could my, I could keep my attention on that a lot more. Yeah. And I really like how there's several parts where like they enter some realm where it's like an alternate reality or it's like they're trapped in a memory space or something. And I think yeah. those are just like super interesting ways to take the characters, you know? Yeah, I think so too. I mean, it's hard for me to remember because like we just watched it all in a blur. But like I definitely was like really emotional about like the whole arc with Glimmer's parents and stuff. So we were we were definitely going to finish it. You know what I mean? Like once we were like... But also it was all out by when we watched, right? So there was no need for a gap. Yeah, what's your second? Okay, so the top of my bottom list is, this is just a me thing, not a fan of like the Catra toenails. I mean, I get it. <laughs> I get it. It makes sense with the character, but it's kind of like, I don't know. You know, it's a, it's a lot to deal with, I think. Wow, okay. Yeah, never even really thought about it, but sure. Well, because she's kind of like in stirrup pants or something in her first outfit. So you see the feet really distinctly. I'm going to, I, internet, don't make me regret, regret this. Google Catra's feet. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> it's that bad? Um, well, the first response, the first, uh, oh my God. response that I got was DeviantArt. They're all DeviantArt and it, oh God, and they're DeviantArt and then they're Fur Affinity. Um, and it, <laughs> Catra's feet in parentheses, close up. Uh, so I don't even know. Okay. So it's clearly working for some of you. And that's oh, fine. Yeah. I'm not here yeah, that's fine. to judge no. you. I'm just... I'm not yucking anybody's yum. I just... I... It's not where... I don't want to go there. But I'm glad y'all have each other. Oh my gosh. Congratulations, uh, furry feet lovers. It's, it's there if you want it. Yeah. Okay? I'm happy for you. And if I hadn't called it out, you may not have known it was there. So... You're welcome. I learned something today. All right. What's the top of your bottom list? <laughs> the top of my bottom list is uh, there's not enough Catradora time. Not enough. Whoa. That's impressive because it's also a lot, but you wanted more. No, I wanted more time. Like, I wanted them together. They spent a lot of the show, like, fighting. Catra trying to destroy Adora and crying about it. And that did make me feel for catch her a lot but at the same time it's like I wanted to see them together more but also like that wasn't totally the the point of the show yeah you know it was about them growing and like this epic battle and everything but you know and it's a kid show I get it but I would have loved more catch her door time yeah totally that's a good one I feel like we often have that on our bottom list right yeah we just want more. Okay, I have a top five about all of Shira, <laughs> but most of it we could go through fast. Only like one do I have to talk a lot. And you said you had a top three. Right? Yeah. So do you do two first? Okay. Okay. So number five is the episode called "Roll with It." It's like this episode where all the characters are imagining how they're gonna sneak into this like into the base or whatever 
but every time they do it they have like a different art style and it's like really cute to see how they imagine the different art styles like i think they're wearing the clothes from the original shira because catra has like all this gaudy makeup on and stuff it's very cute so that was a standout episode for me okay you have to do your next one. Oh yeah that is a good episode though that's a good one and those are call outs to their original characters I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's so cute. All right. The number four for me is the opening song slaps. It's like the, we must be strong. It's like, I just listened to it again today and I put a lyrics video in our show notes. But mm-hmm. like, it's like really a good, like emotional song. Like I was getting goosebumps again, listening to yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. You know what? You did, you did a top five. I'm going to throw in two things that are similar to yours okay Okay. i think my favorite episode is the one where we learn more about mara with madame raz and making the pie hands down my favorite episode oh yeah that one's wild it's so good and it's so sad okay and then mm, the intro i was shocked because i was like tuned out during the intro most of the time and i started watching during the last season and they changed the intro like yeah. every episode and that was so awesome and so special and like yes yeah you're right they do that because i remember pausing it a lot like i think even like in season three we were like wait that's different and we were like okay okay who's that shadow gonna be and like okay that means that that oh. person's there like because yeah there were characters like wasn't there like character who they thought was going to be on the good side and then was a spy it was like double trouble oh yeah Um, yeah i think they had one where she was in the picture and then she's not in the picture anymore or something like they did something wild oh i didn't even realize that was happening before the last season and that's my fault i guess because i just like tuned out the intro but yeah, in the in the last season, it changes a lot because it's like, you know, first it's just like, I can't even go through all of it. But some of the changes were like, no one's chipped. Oh, first we don't know who Hordak Prime is. So he's just yes. a shadow. Then we see, actually see Hordak Prime. Then Hordak Prime starts yes. chipping everybody. And so you see everyone chipped and like being with Hordak. And then, you know, Catra is evil, and then Catra and Adora are fighting, and then Catra and Adora are fighting, but then they stop and they're friends again. It's just like, oh, yeah, you're so right. Good. Okay, hold on. I think there's, I just found like a picture or someone's blog. I'll, I'll put it for the mm, show okay. notes yeah. because I just, I didn't remember this either, but they added Glimmer's dad in at some point, which is like so baller. Yeah, it's so, it's very good. Anyway, we were supposed to speed through that part because I wasn't supposed to have a top five, but whatever. It's our It was podcast. so good. Okay. It's, it's a really special detail. Okay. Do your number three. My number three, the bottom of my top list is all the costumes are good, but Catra's clothes are the best. That's my, <laughs> that's my number three, which I already talked about a little, but I just really love her outfit. Um, it makes me want to make a costume of it. I mean, I can't like the the tuxedo like i just can't explain enough how good the tuxedo is Mm -hmm. like not only because you know it obviously signifies her sexuality or you know playing with her gender and everything but like it's just so beautiful yeah like it looks amazing on her yeah actually oh my god nico you know what we should have opened the episode with i made a marmista costume have I, yeah. you ever seen my Mermista costume? Yeah, I don't know. I think you were on, you were streaming or something. We were hanging out. I uh, posted a picture that one of my old coworkers took of me on Halloween when I made this costume before the pandemic. And I posted it to Twitter and Stevenson liked <gasps> it. And I like Yay! lost my goddamn mind. That's so cool. Yeah. I if I still cosplayed, I probably would make a catcher costume. Like, yeah, I would just like obsessively love that. Mm-hmm. But I don't know; it's hard because Entrapta is really cute too. <laughs> but that I hair, love Entrapta. Entrapta, yeah. Her hair is like it's it's got to be one of those like because it it moves right and it picks up things. That's one of those that like cosplayers can get really creative with. Because, like, your instinct is just to make, like, a volume wig. 
But then part of me is thinking, how can I make it grab things or how can I sit on it? And that's like the type of person I am where I'll make like a really, un like, a, like one that's not easy to get around at a convention, but I would be like, mine's going to be a chair. And that's the one that I'm bringing. Okay. <laughs> like I'm, I'm the entrapped at sitting on my own hair. Like, that's amazing. But yeah, I like love, I love Katra. Yes. All okay. Right. Anyway, tangent over. Marmesta costume tangent over. Okay. Okay. So, in speaking of Entrapta, the moment where Entrapta thirsts after a robot while they're like under attack, um, <laughs> it's like that moment has like. I just like always think about it because it's just like kind of out of nowhere. Like she's driving everybody crazy, right? Because she's like jumping around and like there's all these like robots everywhere scanning things. And then she kind of gets knocked down and this like robot is there. And she's like, oh, hello. You're very technologically advanced. And you're like, what? It's, um, okay. All right. Yeah. We're going there, I guess. And Trapta, yeah. this is probably not the time. Yeah, and that face she makes. <laughs> that face, though. like Yeah, that face, though. Yeah, so that's my number three of, like, they went there with that. Yeah, um, they really did. That's great. That is That moment did stick out to me a lot <laughs> when I was watching it. Okay, my second best thing is Milog being a surrogate for Katra's true feelings. Because Katra Aww. will be, like, screaming at Adora, but then Milog just, like, goes over and hug-tackles Adora, and it's like, yeah, that's because Katra actually loves Milog. <laughs> or, sorry, Aww. that's because Katra actually loves Adora, and then Milog Aww. is like, you know. Right, because they said that, like, Milog's really in tune with people's feelings, right? Yeah. That's so cute. Yeah, I saw someone, one of the videos that I watched said that Milog was Katra's emotional support animal. <laughs> yeah, that is really, really true. And actually, that a little bit ties into my number one, but I'm not there yet. Okay, number two, I just put Scorpia the Sweet Jock. So <laughs> I know we're talking about Katra, but again, I want to say like Scorpia is a character that normally wouldn't work for me. Or, like, I would just be like, yeah, okay, whatever. She's, like, kind of, like, not annoying, but, like, you know, she just, like, talks a lot and is cheery and stuff. But, man, she grows on you. And I think she's my favorite character. Because she, like, she's so, ah, uh, you just, like, can't be mad at her. Like, she's so sweet and funny. She's very funny. And, like, yeah. um, she doesn't give up on their friendship either like she's on the bad side but like neither her or entrapta are like really bad right like they're not and like of course it turns out catcher is not really bad either she's just trying really hard to be bad but like scorpio looks bad but she's not like she's very nice and considerate and excited to have friends and like you know just like a really special character and also has like a really cool look to her because she doesn't look like stereotypically feminine or like, yeah. you know, and, but is like such, like just such a cool person that I think that's just really important for people to see different looks, right? Yeah. Uh, and also Scorpia, like once she reconnects with the princess, like stone or what the garnet, I forget what it is because she's actually a princess and she reconnects with the stone, she's actually, like, mad powerful. Like, she can go head-to-head -head with all the other princesses. Yeah, she's really special. I agree. Okay. Oh, the top of my best list was Future Catra. I loved Future Catra. Oh, I loved yes. her outfit. I loved her, like, seeing them being happy in this, like, little... I mean, I guess it was kind of, like... It's supposed to be, like, something that Adora wants. It's not actually the future, but it feels like the future. And it's just... Yeah, and her clothes are so nice. I love yeah. her clothes. I love her hairstyle. I, just, I love seeing that they are going to be happy and seeing everybody else that's in that little snippet. And I don't know what else to say about it. I just like it a lot. <laughs> 
It's like so much happens in just a couple minutes. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I agree. She's really sweet. Okay, so the, the top of my top list, you might have guessed it. I don't know how I'm going to talk about this with all my feelings because it's really important. It's the finale where Katra opens the door and reaches for, for Adora and grabs her hand. And I... No, I probably told you this before. I literally like screamed and cried <laughs> like a crazy person because that moment is almost frame by frame the ending of Utena. And okay. it was like I like could not believe my eyes because Revolutionary Girl Utena is like one of my favorite series ever and it gets a lot of credit by being, it's like it influenced a lot of other shows that have a lot of uh, romantic elements between women. So I know like Steven Universe was really influenced by it. Another anime I'm really into, Princess Tutu, which I will force you to watch at some point. <laughs> it's like Okay. Well, like Sailor Moon too, right? The whole magical girl transformation. I don't think we're going to, like, cover Utena because it, it's, like, not really got a hot baddie. Like, the bad guys are, like, they actually suck. Um, mm -hmm. But Revolutionary Girl Utena was made by the uh, same director as Sailor Moon, who, I mean, I, again, I'm paraphrasing, but, like, basically wanted to make his own magical girl show after helping make Sailor Moon so popular. And the show is totally out there. There's all these like references and elements to things. Like there's things that I still don't know if anyone's ever figured out what they mean. Like there'll be like the stopwatch, like things will happen and they'll like close in on the stopwatch and have a time on there. So it's like, what do all those times mean? And mm -hmm. like some of the songs are like translated, like, like Jewish folk songs and like references to the French Revolution. Like it's a really, really deep show. Okay. But the gist of Revolutionary Girl Utena, and it's really Utena, I'm like pronouncing it wrong. Sorry. Okay. I'm too excited. It's about a girl who was saved in a fairy tale way that is explained much later. She was saved by a prince. And instead of growing up to be a princess, she decides she will become a prince that saves other girls. And so she wears like the boys uniform at the high school and very early on meets a girl who's the Rose Bride and finds out that this girl is being passed around between people who duel in the forest. So she doesn't really know what the duels are, but she's like, I don't think this is right. So she fights for her and wins early on. And then everybody else keeps fighting her to get her back because there's this like legend that the one who controls the Rose Bride is going to like find some eternal power. But Utena is like, I don't care about eternal power. What I care about is this girl, Anthe, who you're forcing to be the Rose Bride. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe she should have to be owned by somebody. Mm -hmm. And so like the whole thing is about like Anthe being friends with Utena and like eventually will she realize she can be her own person or not? I see. And it's really dark in a lot of places and there's a lot of really messed up romance, literal like creepy sister and brother relationships and stuff like that. Okay, sure. Anime shit. Yes. <laughs> But, like, it's a show that definitely, like, my whole brain exploded when I saw it as a teenager. And I've never forgotten it. It's such a good show. And then, like, just to see that, I knew. Like, the second I saw it, I knew what they were doing. And if you go on Tumblr and stuff, there's, like, people who have, like, the shots next to each other. So you can see that they're, like, exactly the same. But there mm. was also this person on Tumblr that did this really cool breakdown of how they switched the roles. So instead of like, it, like you would think that Adora would be Utena because she's like the big heroic one. But the way they do it at the end of She-Ra is that like Catra is the one that's saving Adora. So she's mm -hmm. like taking on the hero role, the Utena role. And it's just like, it's just like so much thought went into that. Yeah. that's only special for people in the know and like yeah. the fact that they did that like i really like literally bawled 
Like, and that's how much it meant to me. So I can't, like, I don't even know what that means. Like, to me, it means, like, they knew something that was really important to pr- a previous show that celebrated women being in love with women. And they were like, we have to pay homage to that. But also that they were able to do it in a way that made total sense, but that you didn't even have to know. Because I think that's the other part is like a good homage should not sacrifice the current show, right? Like it shouldn't be like, I don't get this if I don't know the thing you're referencing. And yeah, I, I don't think that it suffered for that. I think you would have like no real thought about it. Just be like, oh, this is a really cool, cool frame shot, you know? So okay, I think it were it's it's even better than like being an homage that doesn't make the the work executing the homage suffer. But if anything, if you know the reference, it actually reinforces the thing we were talking about earlier, which is like Catra has to be there to keep Adora from yes. dying, right? Yeah. Like they both have to be there, yeah. and like in that in that way, C- Catra is saving Adora because Catra is telling her like Adora. Like, you're worth more than you give to other people, right? Like, you are worth more than just sacrificing yourself for everyone else. So, like, yes. that, yes. them, that, using that homage actually, like, introduces something to the way, the relationship of the characters that maybe you weren't thinking about, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, I think I'll try to find for you, like... A post about it in case somebody wants to like read about it it looks like i'm just looking and seeing there's all these like journalists posts that are just like you know utena's lasting impact on queer female-led storytelling which i think is just about a bunch of different things mm-hmm. uh, you know i mentioned steven universe and she-ra and stuff and even like a-, a book we may be talking about later iron widow like even in that i was like oh i bet that was a nutena reference because there's like a part where a sword came out and that's mm-hmm. the other thing is like they when they do the duel whoever is in control or engaged to the rose bride pulls a sword out of her chest and that's the oh. sword you fight with but it's also really grisly imagery even though she's alive it's like just the act of it appearing and pulling it out is like kind of disturbing you know but like in general i would say like utana is like definitely a show about feminism and about female empowerment and and realizing you don't have like you don't have to do things for other people even if society tells you to but it's also a big show about coming of age because they are in high school and like almost every character is like stuck in a limbo where they are trying to figure out how they can grow up and how to get out of some rut that they're in. So yeah, it's wild. So wow. Okay. I definitely want to watch it now. I yeah. I think you should please. I I definitely want to watch it now. You sold me. You sold me more than what I knew about it before. So okay. That's our best of list, right? We're done with top and bottom moments. Yes, we're done. As done as we can be. <laughs> All right. You back me into a conspiracy corner. I don't have a lot of conspiracies. I was just going to make the case that Shadow Weaver is actually a hot baddie. I don't know. Do we want to get into this? We've already this we've already like, have like a pretty long recording time. I mean, give it just give it put your feelers out there a little bit, right? Okay. Okay. So, here's my case for Shadow Weaver is a hot baddie. Okay, sh- let me let me preface this. Shadow Weaver is a hot baddie in the way that many of our hot baddies are. This is a show for children, and this is a problematic character. This is someone who has abused people yeah. and like caused harm to the main characters that we're rooting for. However, that's the case of a lot of the hot baddies that we talk about. And I wasn't I maybe struggle isn't the right word, but it just occurred to me as I was watching She-Ra that if Shadow Weaver was a male character, that Mm -hmm. I would immediately be like, Shadow Weaver's a hot baddie. It's like a mysterious figure, wears a mask, uh, is very powerful with like a dark magic, influences others, convinces them to do things they wouldn't normally do, 
this is like a hot body relationship that I'm having with Shadow Weaver. It is not in the show at all, right? Because that would be that would be really weird because Shadow Weaver is like a mother figure to right. like our main characters. Yeah, there was just like that was in the back of my mind. And then I saw that part in the finale where I wouldn't say she's redeemed. It kind of resolves an issue in the show that she sacrifices herself because she is such a problematic character and they don't have to figure out what to do with her after, right? It kind of like ties a bow on that whole issue. But because that was in the back of my head and like she, you think she gets all the way to the heart of Eternia with Adora and Adora is sick, but Adora won't stay there and do the thing she needs to do because she's going to go back for Catra because she hears Catra yelling. So you think in the shot, when the shot ends and they cut to where Catra is, you think that Shadow Weaver's just going to go for the heart of Etheria and she's just going to take the power for herself. But what she does is she walks all the way back with sick Adora and then saves Catra and kind of has this like nice closure moment. And then she takes, I am getting like goosebumps thinking about it. She takes her mask off and then she like destroys herself, presumably, and the monster. And like, I just, I feel like That is something. And it's only because, like, it's only because I, because of, like, my own social conditioning that it wasn't immediate to me that's like, oh, Shadow Weaver's also kind of hot, you know? Yeah. Because she is, like, a a female character. Like, shady backstory, backstabbed a bunch of people, super powerful, super mysterious, like, um, and then ends up having, like, a little bit of a redeeming, like, arc. Yeah, and I feel like they they kind of say this in the show too, but like it's like if she hadn't done that, you could just hate her, right? Yeah. But because she did this, like I think Catcher does say something like, "Why did you do this for me?" Like I still don't like you, but it's like internally she's like it's like more conflicted, right? Yeah. Because she did this thing that means she wasn't totally bad even though she did all these really bad things. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a lot of complexity for sure. Yeah, so that's why, I mean, I love Katra, I love all the other princesses, I love Mermista, I, we already, you said this at the opening, but we were talking about my voice, like Mermista <laughs> and her that voice actress, I love her whole thing and her delivery and everything, but I have to say, I think Mara, the the previous she and Shadow Weaver are actually my favorite, my actual favorite characters, and Entrapta, I love Entrapta, but like, those are my like favorites that's cool well shadow weaver doesn't she have like this like adora kind of thing that she yeah. always does too yeah like, that's cool i'm really glad i don't think i had such a strong reaction to that but i i i bet in the moment i was feeling it because that whole like like i was real tender like the whole last two seasons of cheer like the stuff with glimmer's parents like i was like tearing the whole time and Mm -hmm. like anything that happened with scorpia and like people being separated from each other with everyone being chipped and it was awful you know so yeah yeah i definitely think by that point i'm just like i can't take much more (laughs) you know like it's so much yeah i don't know why that just like really it just really stuck with me like that moment really hit for me and it does like it does put into question like all of her behavior before towards Katra, right? Yeah. Where was it actually coming from? Yeah. Well, she was trying to like save herself or I don't know. She talks about it a little bit, I think, at one point. And it isn't a good reason. And I you don't agree with her. Like I think very few if any people are gonna agree with her reasoning. But right. yeah, it just I just think she's a really interesting character and I like that a lot. So yeah, that's my that's my conspiracy corner is Shadow Weaver is actually a badder hot baddie than Catra, maybe even. Fair. Yeah. I mean, we knew we were getting into this with the whole concept of the podcast, but like we're d we don't necessarily agree with everything that these characters do oh, to no. like them, you know? Like it's okay to have like a separation there of like in a fantasy fictional setting, there are things that are likable about these characters yeah and i'm also like i'm reaching for that one like that's not given in the yeah in the material very much but Mm -hmm. i really like shadow weaver 
should we move on? Yeah. Okay. And then we have a other hot character section, which is like basically everyone could have been in this list because like we were saying, there's someone for everybody. So even yes. if we didn't list them, you might think other characters are deserving. Well, even between us, I was like, yeah, who has to be on the other hot characters list? We were like Entrapped, obviously. Scorpia, that, you know, that's Scorpia. And I was like, double trouble. And you were like, really? Double trouble? And I was like, absolutely <laughs> double <laughs> trouble. Like, what are, we, what are we even doing here? What are we doing here? It's fair enough. Also, like, we didn't, I didn't put Glimmer on this list, but one of the things I think is funny about Shira is I think it's like, there's the character you think you are, but then the character you really are. So, mm -hmm. like, in my mind, I'm in Trapta because she's like smart and she likes little food and she's like funny. But I think I'm actually Glimmer, <laughs> the sad past and the one who's like whining and like then trying to organize everybody else and be serious. <laughs> I feel like I'm actually Glimmer. I don't know who I wish I was, but I might actually be Bo because I just want everyone to be happy and get along. <laughs> and then in the end, I might be kind of grumpy about it, which is funny because in the same way that you're saying like, Bo is probably a character in she -Rot. There's nothing wrong with him. He's a very sweet boy, but... I probably give the least amount of thought to him as a character. Just like, oh, there's Bo. Oh, I'll come to bat for Bo in a second, but I want to hear what you think of Double Trouble first. He's a good, he's a good boy. I just... He's a good boy. Yes. <laughs> okay, Double Trouble. I need to make a case for Double Trouble. Okay, so Double Trouble, we have an androgynous thing going on. Double Trouble is super, like, playful, very yeah. into themselves very confident it's just like double troubles on double troubles team like right it's just yeah. looking out for double trouble just very cunning i don't know there's just causing a lot of trouble yeah double trouble even where they're pretending to be that prince right that was pretty good is that the pika blue one yeah 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 i don't know they just they have a whole like thing going on they're very like roguish you know yeah Playing for both teams, like, literally. and In every sense. <laughs> yeah. Probably, yeah. No, definitely, like, a really cool character. Just not one I had thought deeply about in that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, for Bo, I think it's, like, similar to Scorpio, where at first I didn't really think much about Bo. I'm like, yeah, he's a good guy, you know? Likes to rip the bomb part of his shirt off a lot, you know? <laughs> But there's like a few episodes where everybody loses faith and Bo is the one who's like, we're not giving up. Like we can make it out of this situation. And it's just like, you know, it's like very like beta male. Like I don't have to be like the raging jerk male that's aggro. I'm the one who's going to nurture and take care of the group. And it's just like made me really happy <laughs> so so he grew on me too I would say like at the beginning I was like not super noticing him but then like over time I feel like he does have these moments where he's really cool in his own way and it's also like just really cute because like he doesn't really have powers right he's kind of like the gadget person because he has these yeah. arrows that do really weird stuff mm -hmm. um he still tries his hardest, even if he doesn't have anything magical to back it up, right? Yeah, that's true. No, that, I have nothing against him. It's just like, when I think about the show, it just, I don't, he's not the character that sticks out the most to me. That's all. Yeah. Nothing, I have nothing against Bo. And then Mermista has great outfit and is very sassy and fun. Yeah, and very strong and begrudgingly like Seahawk. You are Mermissa because you had, there's like the murder mystery episode. Yeah. That's like so your thing. She loves murder mysteries. Like Seahawk is one that I don't think about often. <laughs> but then oh, there's yeah. the fact that Jordan Fisher <laughs> is Seahawk. So. Yeah. Actually, I think, I don't know. I I want to be Mermista, but I might actually be Bo. That's, that's what it is, actually. I think you're you're a bit of both. Mara is like I don't know if you want to talk more about Mara. I don't know exactly why I put Mara on the hot characters list. I mean, there's the thing, Mara's not not hot. 
but we don't see that much of her but i guess it's just like she's so strong willed and like i mean she makes a huge sacrifice she sacrifices her life for to save the planet i i think it just came up because like people love mara like you can find tons of tiktoks about mara and youtube videos about mara and it's really interesting because until unless you watched into season four or five like you don't even know who this character is but she has yeah. all these like very i think well deserved emotional moments that people really connect with and i really like mara and i like her arc and i like the way they tell her story and the my favorite thing about her is that she makes this sacrifice and i think adora kind of like gets that in her head that like I have to do the same thing, but in the end, they learn some things, some additional things about Mara, and, like, she doesn't know that sacrificing herself was the right choice, or that it, it was definitely not something she wanted to do. So even this character that's only in the show for, like, a few episodes in two seasons of the show also has this, like, arc. So, yeah, I really like Mara. I just, I like her character, period. Yeah, it's been a little bit since I've seen the show, so I don't really remember as much about her. But, like, I feel like that's really exciting when a character is, like, you just get little snippets of them, and then you're, like, trying to piece that together. It's, like, a really exciting character to be a fan of. Because yeah. there's, like, so much depth there that you want to explore further. Okay, is it time to rate? All right, you It's time to rate. All right. On the resand scale. Resand. Just say his name three times and maybe he'll appear. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> All right. So at the end of the episode, we rate each character on a scale of one to ten, where resand is an eleven, and we say, How great is this character? Do you want to go first? Or do you want me to go first? I can go first, because I always make you go first because I don't think about <laughs> it and then I I leave it to the last second. Uh, uh huh. I think Katra is, oh my god, now I'm, I don't know what to say. It's so much pressure to do this. Okay, I was going to say eight. I think she's an eight. I love her, but now we screamed about her so much. So should she be higher than that? I think she's an eight. I think she's an eight. You're going to go with an eight? I think right. so. What are you going to go with? See, now I'm nervous. You're going to be like 9.5 or something. Well, that's it's fine for us to be different from each other a little bit. <sighs> um, so I was going to go a, a little lower. Because, okay. But, okay, I was going to go a little lower, but mostly because I'm like, it's just the beginning of the season of our podcast. Like, we can't give everybody, like, the best score ever. But then... I was thinking about how, like, I think what really sways it up for me is the parallels with Utena, because that's, like, so important to me. Mm. And I do think she is, like, a really rare character who's a bad girl villain that actually gets with the main character. And that's so cool. Like, she was not a queer bait. She actually does get with her and get yeah. redeemed. And... So I went with eight. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, it's hard. You know, part of me feels like maybe we should, I wonder if we should break our ratings into like sub ratings or something. Because for me, it's like, there are characters that are highly rated for me because they're just like very hot. But there's like not a lot of emotional like kitchen or emotional growth there. I think that's okay. Yeah. And then there's characters who are like, yeah, Catra's hot, but the show's not like, the show's for kids. So there's not like sex or sexiness in it, like super explicitly, you know, but there's so much, such an emotional connection to Catra and her growth and like what her character represents and how she overcomes that and how they end up being together. And so yeah. like in that way, she's rated higher. But yeah. anyway, there's like, there's at least two ways that like characters are hot so far uh -huh. i think that's okay though it's like totally subjective like it's whatever you want it to be and you can change your mind in every episode if you want <laughs> okay. i'm still hoping that we'll figure out a way in the discord 
for people to like type to a bot and rate it rate characters themselves and then oh. we can like see how the the listeners like who's going to get voted highest of the listeners votes you know i think that could be really cool so yeah i have a lot of potential ideas for the website and we'll just have to see like how big the podcast gets, I guess, and how much time I have to devote to like building these things out. Cause I think we could have a lot of cool things, but it would take time for me to make. Yeah, we have to know that you want it because a lot of times we're just making content and we don't know if people are listening or if they yeah. want these kinds of features. So um, if you're listening to this, like let us know, like talk to us and tell us what kind of thing you would want to see. It'll be really funny if we get to the end and like everybody is rated really high, but maybe that's just how it's going to go. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe we would have to like adjust our ratings after we get some more or something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But I feel like she deserves this. So, okay. With that, Catra is officially added to the Hot Baddies Club. I love those hot baddies. And now just a little bit of info if you liked Katra, if you want to see other shows that have characters like her uh liz you wrote uh steven universe as your recommendation yeah stylistically thematically tonally it's very similar so and also i think uh i saw a piece of an interview while i was reading that said that like steven universe was kind of an influence or at least like Steven Universe existing allowed she to like look and feel the way that it did because they could point to something and be like look how successful this thing is yeah. and it covers these themes and these topics and it's kind of for kids but adults like it too and it looks like this and like that gave them more license to be able to make the thing that they wanted to make. Yeah and then I've already talked a lot about Revolutionary Girl Utena. You know it's uh I think it's just a really interesting anime. It is a little bit more dated because it's from the 90s and it gets, it's like 39 episodes long. So it gets a lot better after the first season because the first season is kind of like, it is kind of a magical girl show. And then it breaks the tropes down and gets weirder and weirder. So especially if you like the darker stuff in she I think you'll like, Utena a lot. It gets really dark. And okay. so yeah, there's definitely some like kind of stuff to watch out for their content wise about ways that men can be bad to women. It's never like graphic, but you know, they're you know subdued in terrible ways sometimes. There's yeah. some really bad characters on that show that are really mean. And I recommend you watch the show before you watch the movie. And yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's definitely worth it. Cool. If you liked Catra, I think you'll like Ada Wong, who I think we're talking about soon. So <laughs> look forward to that. I think that's accurate. Okay, so I am your co-host, Liz. Uh, you can find me at Liz Makes on Twitter and at Illuminated Space almost everywhere else. What about you, Miko? I'm your co-host Miko, and you can find me as Dr. Mikachu, Dr. Mikachu, on Twitch, where I stream game development every week, and on Twitter. Okay, you can find the podcast a lot of different places. The best way to figure out all the places we are is by going to hotbaddies.club forward slash links, and there's just a page that just has all the links for everything. We have a website, we have a TikTok, we have an Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, whatever. We are at Hot Baddies Club most places, except for Instagram, where we're Hot Baddies Club podcast. We are not Hot Baddies Club on Instagram. You can join our Discord community by going to discord.hotbaddies.club. Our theme song is The Hot Baddies Club by Riako. You can find the song and the rest of her amazing music on her Bandcamp website, riako.bandcamp.com. That's R-Y-A-K-O dot bandcamp.com and yeah i think that's gonna close us out right. for today i guess the last thing we could say is bye, bye dora, dora. You
my god, this fan art that you have in here is <laughs> thirsty. Is too powerful. Oh my god. 